Hi, everybody. It's uh, Mike Putman. I am a rheumatologist at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I am very excited to be coming to you at Room Now Live to talk about Inca associated vasculitis myths and misconceptions. So, I'd like to start with the case presentation. This is a patient that I was consulted on the hospital. He's a 58 year old man who presented with shortness of breath was found to have diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, which rapidly progressed to respiratory failure and intubation. I think this is probably familiar to all of you. This is a pretty classic, pretty, pretty classic presentation of vasculitis. Four years prior, he was diagnosed with ankyl-associated vasculitis after presenting with kidney injury. So he had immune GN on a biopsy, so no mysteries here. He had a PR3 um, titer of 220. He had initially responded well to rituximab, but he developed hypogammaglobulinemia and was switched to azathioprine, one of my least favorite medicines, but not a crazy choice in this scenario. Now, I was counseled on the case and I gave my preliminary recommendations and the family reached out to me because they wanted to have a meeting. And they said, <clears throat> We reached out to a close family friend who is the, um, some high ranking position at some fancy big hospital, which is the, a very high ranking, according to US News and World Reports. <laughs> they said, our friend said that rituximab is better than cyclophosphamide for a relapse in ankyvasculitis and plasma exchange is not recommended. Our friend also said that we treat patients with a medicine called avacapan now instead of steroids and that patients who get it do much better. Now. This is a, a common interaction for folks who are near uh, very big fancy hospitals, uh, which have very high rankings on US News and Ro World Reports. And my first reaction to this is always, um, that's great. Um, I always say that I love second opinions. I want second opinions. I would say that the worst thing that can happen to you from a second opinion is that they confirm what you already said. Because if a patient is going to find advice from someone else, it means that things aren't going well. This patient is intimated, they're in the ICU, and I wholeheartedly endorse this family reaching out to a friend. And, you know, I, I think it's great and I always encourage it. Now, the thing they said last was, why are you recommending all the wrong things? And when you look at these statements, it actually sounds like maybe I am, right? They, um, they, they, I was not recommending rituximab. Um, I was recommending plasma exchange. And I was not pushing Avacapan at this point, And I was recommending steroids. So I was doing all of the things that ostensibly may not be quite in keeping with how we manage ankyvasculitis. So why is that? And the rest of this presentation, I'd like to walk you through why my practices here felt a little bit idiosyncratic to these people. And of course, the very high ranking doctor at the big fancy hospital. Now, you know, people will often say rituximab is better for relapsing disease. And this always twerk, gets me a little bit frustrated. And, and here's why. This is where that comes from. This is the RAVE trial. It was published in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a randomized controlled trial of rituximab against cyclophosphamide. It was a non-inferiority design. So it didn't set out to prove that one was better than the other necessarily, but in one of those post hoc analyses, they saw that among patients who came into the trial with relapsing disease, those patients, 67% as highlighted here, got better compared to 42% of those who were new onset disease. So what does that tell you? That tells you obviously that rituximab is better for relapsing disease, but not so fast. The critical fact here is that this happened in 2010. Now, this is my son and he's picking clover and he found a four leaf clover. And when he showed it to me, he said, dad, I have a great allegory for why rituximab is not necessarily better for, no, I'm just kidding. No, he actually said, hey dad, I, I found a four leaf clover, I, I'm really lucky. And then he said something really interesting to me. He said, if all the clovers were four leaved, would three leaf clovers be lucky? And that, that's really thoughtful, right? And this applies to ankyvasculitis, of course, because I wanna ask you, if all the patients in the RAVE trial had been relapsing after they got rituximab, would rituximab or cyclophosphamide have looked better? Because in the RAVE trial, everyone who relapsed had relapsed after getting cyclophosphamide, right? Because it was 2010, there wasn't a ton of people getting rituximab. And so of course people who had already relapsed after getting cyclophosphamide did better when we gave them a different drug for reinduction therapy. I don't know which one's better, but I don't think it's obvious that rituximab is better for relapsing disease, and certainly not for someone who relapsed after receiving rituxin, rituxin for induction maintenance. All right, 
Now, the other thing that I was doing here that might be quirky, according to Big Fancy Doctor at Big Fancy Hospital, is that I was recommending plasma exchange. And, um, you know, the guidelines recommend not using plasma exchange for moderate severe disease. Um, plasma exchange is, um, you know, one of these things that we had a big trial in 2020 that showed it wasn't. And so why would I recommend plasma exchange? Well, well, here's why. So this is the PEXAVAS trial. In 2020, it was published. It was a huge effort. Over 700 people randomized to receive plasma exchange or none in a factorial design. We'll talk about the steroids later. But they either got plasma exchange or not. And this is the Kaplan-Meier curve from that trial. And you can see that people were no more or less likely to die or get in-stage kidney disease whether or not they got plasma exchange. And plasma exchange is a lot of work. It's a lot of money. And so they said, hey, I mean, if this doesn't seem to help people, why do it? Well, here's why. And you should think about this with all studies that you're reading. What kind of patients made it into Pexavas? Now, a lot of them were sick, but if you look at the subset of people who had severe pulmonary hemorrhage, like our patient who are in the ICU, who were intubated, were bleeding into their lungs all over the place, and ask yourself, what percent of people in the Pexavas study met that phenotype? The answer is 9%. Very few people were this sick with this bad of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Now, this is a subset analysis that happened after the trial. Um, it's still waiting to be published. Um, I think Fustner is working on this right now. But so this is a Kaplan-Meier curve, and you can see that there's a couple different lines. And let me tell you, the lines tell you everything you need to know here. This red line that looks really bad on this survival curve because patients are dying is the people with really severe diffuse alveolar hemorrhage who did not get plasma exchange. Then the gray line above it, which looks a little bit better, that's the people who did. And so I ask the, the, I always ask my patients, or I always ask myself when I'm talking about this, I say, if you had severe diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, on which of these curves would you like to be? This isn't statistically significant. This is post hoc analysis. It's of only 9% from the trial. But boy, I really want to be on that gray curve, right? And so I still give plasma exchange for some cases of ankylosing vasculitis, specifically people who are rapidly progressive kidney disease and people who have really bad, really bad intubated diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Now, the family also had said, you know, we treat this with the vacapan these days, right? We don't use steroids for ankyovasculitis. And this is obviously the advocate trial, the very famous 2021 trial where they gave a vacapan um, or steroids for patients with moderate severe ankyovasculitis. And, you know, I think there's a common misconception, which is that patients in this trial who got a vacapan didn't get steroids. That is just not true. So this graph here is um, the mean total prednisone equivalent dose by treatment group. And if you look in the avacapan group, the mean steroids in the avacapan group at week zero is like 21, 22, something like that, milligrams daily. So the avacapan group was already getting steroids. Now, some of that was because they're getting rituximab and they got steroids with rituximab, but a lot of it was because these patients had ankyovasculitis and their doctors started them on steroids while they waited to get into the trial. And so the fact that they did well once they got avacapan doesn't necessarily mean that they don't need steroids. It means that after you give them a little steroids up front, maybe they don't need a vacapan. So even when I'm giving a vacapan, I am still giving people a little bit of steroids up front because I don't know that this really applies to a patient where you can say you don't need a vacapan or you don't need steroids at all. Now, there's some other issues. And the one that really bothers me the most is this idea that a vacapan was superior to corticosteroids steroids at week 52. I think that's true if you do not know how to treat ANCA-associated vasculitis. Now, here's a diagram that I made for publication in an editorial we just recently wrote. And this is complicated because the trial is complicated. But up at the top, you can see people, the people who got in this trial, the, the investigator was allowed to decide to give you rituximab or cyclophosphamide. So coming in, we didn't know what, which one you were going to get. So that means there's a group of people who got cyclophosphamide and there's a group of people who got rituximab, right? Then we randomized you to a vacpan or to prednisone. Now, the people who were randomized to cyclophosphamide, or who were, sorry, the people who were on cyclophosphamide who were randomized to avacapan, they were followed by azathioprine. And then if they were randomized to prednisone, that's that top one still, then they didn't, they were also given azathioprine for maintenance. Now, the people who were given rituximab at the investigator's discretion and then were randomized to avacapan or prednisone, those people did not get any maintenance therapy afterwards. So you can see the avacapan group got a little bit of avacapan throughout the study, but the people who were given rituximab and randomized to the prednisone taper, at week 20, they stopped all therapy. No more steroids, 
We did not redose rituximab. That's right. They did not get maintenance rituximab. They didn't get maintenance azathioprine. They went completely untreated for 32 full weeks. And this is why I say, if you don't know how to treat ankyovasculitis, then you will see a difference. And if you see over here where it says second primary endpoint sustained remission, that explains the whole trial, the whole superiority dogma at week 52. People who got a vacpan and were on cyclophosphamide who got maintenance did no better or worse than people who got the prednisone taper and maintenance therapy. People who were given rituximab for induction and got a vacpan did much better than those who got rituximab, 20 weeks of steroid, and then YOLO, see you in 32 weeks. And this is why it bothers me to say that it's superior at week 52, because that's basically based on this idea that we didn't treat the people in the rituximab group with any maintenance therapy, which I think is very inappropriate. All right, so then the last thing I wanna talk about is steroids. And steroids is tough here, right? We all hate steroids. Number one cause of mortality in ankyovasculitis is um, uh, 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 infections from glucocorticoid related side effects. Glucocorticoids are our best worst drug. I always say they're great, except for all the horrific things they're gonna to do to you. Now, in the PEXVAS study, which I mentioned, the um, patients were also randomized to either a high dose or low dose steroid taper, which was really useful. And here's the Kaplan-Meier curve that described that. You can tell that people who got the reduced dose regimen and the standard dose regimen had no difference in the primary outcome. And there was a benefit with regard to serious infections. So same outcome and less infections. Sounds like everyone should be on the low dose Paxivast steroid taper, right? That is what the guidelines recommend. Well, not so fast. Again, only 30% of people in the Paxivast study had um, severe uh, kidney disease or were undergoing dialysis. So 70% of people, kidneys not so bad. And again, only 9% had severe diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Our patient is one who is in the ICU, intubated with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, prior severe kidney involvement. Ah, this is not someone that I'm going to even consider giving the low-dose steroid taper to. This is a paper we wrote a little while back. I think it's good to visualize what exactly I'm talking about. So this blue and red line are the high dose, the standard taper from PEXVAS trial. Now, the green and the light blue line are the, uh, is a steroid taper from the Advocate study and from the Pexivas low. So you can see there's actually like kind of two different approaches here, right? And then down at the very bottom is the low vast low steroid taper. This is a different trial I don't want to get into for the sake of time. But essentially, I think there's probably three different approaches to steroids in this disease. For people who are very sick, I still feel uncomfortable not giving a good amount of steroids. And so I would err towards something resembling the blue or red curves here. Now, if people are in the moderate severe, they're not intubated, they don't have rapidly progressive renal disease, then I'm gonna err more on the side of the Paxivas low steroid taper or a taper similar to what was done in Advocate, although I would redose it and give people maintenance therapy. And then there are a subset of people who have good prognostic factors, older, um, specific ancestries and who um, have MPO positivity, who respond well upfront to therapy, who probably need very little steroids in this disease. And so there's even some people who I accelerate the taper with. And if I'm giving a vac pan to someone who's not very sick, I will put them more on that low vast low style steroid taper. So my take home point from recent trials is that steroids should not be a one size fits all approach for ankyovasculitis. There are ankyosocial vasculitis. There are people who need a little bit more. They're really sick people in the ICU. There are people who are in the middle. And then there are people who could probably fly with very, very little, especially if you give them a vacapan. So to recap, you know, we talked to the family as usual, and you know, this is my biggest recommendation for second opinions is you need to embrace the second opinion. So I said, oh yeah, big fancy doctor at big fancy hospital. I know that guy. He's great. I love him. We're good friends because we are. And then I said, you know, I love that hospital too. They do great work. And I said, you know, we um, are fine giving rituximab for induction therapy. I think cyclophosphamide may have been a marginally better approach. I think the hate on cyclophosphamide has gone too far I'm trying to bring back cyclophosphamide, but um. I think it would have been reasonable to give cyclophosphamide, but rituximab was also reasonable, and he has responded up front. So in that case, let's give rituximab. Now, the family did agree to plasma exchange because I walked them through the data and said, you know, I think in this case, the benefits do out outweigh the risks, and they agreed to go on steroids because, frankly, the guy was on the ICU intubated with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. I think he needed steroids. 
So we gave a beefy version of the lower dose regimen because they were very worried. He had a bad time with steroids in the first run. I, I totally get it. A lot of this is patient preference. We did prescribe a VACPAN. And the reason I hadn't recommended up front was because the patient was intubated. And we don't know if we can crush a VACPAN. So um, in this case, we started after extubation. And we did that because, you know, A, I was giving a little less than a high-dose steroid regimen. And B, um, I was worried about the kidneys. And C, it is another um, uh, active drug for this disease. Now, because we do know how to treat associated vasculitis, we redosed rituximab at week 26 as per the standard of care. Now, I saw him in follow-up uh, a couple weeks back, and he is doing very well. So the story has a happy ending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a little bit about the management of vasculitis. I hope you're having a great time at Room Now Live. This is a really great meeting, and I am really grateful and honored to have been a part of it. So thank you so much for having me.